Right now, we are with Anne Shao at an American Chinese Convention in Washington, 2018. So you just finished a panel discussion, right? Give us a brief introduction about yourself. Uh, did you want me to hold that? Yes. Oh. Um, so my name is Ann Shaw, and I am uh, on, the, on the national United Chinese American Board as well as our local Illinois chapter. Uh, I'm a civil rights attorney, and um, I have been, uh, I've ran for office in Chicago, which is a very difficult city to run in, and I've helped many uh, Asian Americans run their campaigns and actually help win their campaigns as well in Chicago and actually across the country. And it's very, very important that we um, be involved in the process. Thank you. You just mentioned about that uh, Chicago is a very difficult place to run. Uh, so what's about Chicago, Chicago? Why it is so difficult? Well, Chicago has a kind of a infamous history uh, when it comes to politics. And um, men, there's many people there who want to run. So we're competing with a lot of people, like uh, people from the Hispanic community, from the African American community, and then the general community. So uh, Asian Americans, we, we have been trying to run, but not many of us have. So um, because very few of us ran, we couldn't even sue the government um, to try to create districts where there's more Asian Americans so we can try to get somebody to win because they said we didn't show enough evidence that there were so many Asians running and losing. That's how bad it was and I know this because I was on that committee in Chicago to try to do that and I was going to be one of the attorneys helping to file that lawsuit. So the other side of the problem is that the Asian population is, is kind of small. We're about 5% of the uh, Illinois and Chicago population. and we, But we are still the fastest growing, but it's still small. And we're all spread out. So um, our first, we had our first um, Illinois, Asian American Illinois state representative elected in Illinois just in 2016 because year, many years earlier, we fought and lobbied successfully to get create a, a, a district that included Chinatown in Chicago. And, and uh, so we were able to create a district with 25% uh, Asian Americans, which is actually a lot in one state representative district. And that actually made the difference because she ended up winning by 500 votes. So that's a lot, but it's also very tight. And that's why it was so historic. And I believe we were able to do that by getting that district and having the right candidate and then everybody pushing in and also registering a lot of Chinese American voters. If the Chinese American voters didn't come out, if the candidate didn't push hard for us to get them to come vote, uh, I don't think she would have won. But the other side of the coin is because we had a Chinese candidate who cared about the community, the Chinese voters wanted to come out to vote. So they used to say, oh, Chinese people, they don't want to vote, or Asian people don't want to vote. But the reality is, one, nobody reaches out to them. Two, there's, they don't feel motivated to come out. So when you bring the right candidate and we push out and we reach out to get them to vote and we help them vote, they come out and we can get success and results. So it's a great story you just shared with us. So what motivates you to reach out to them and encourage them to vote and also participate in the civic? Um, so when I was younger, uh, my father, uh, he's Chinese American, uh, he was discriminated at his job. He worked for the state. They actually said that because you're Chinese, we can't promote you. And he was so angry. Because he was Chinese? They told him that. Because they have no care for us. They think we don't care, we're not going to do anything, that we're scared. So my father got so angry, he went and filed a federal lawsuit. And he won his case. He was so tough, and I saw him. I was uh, going to go to college, or excuse me, um, no, I was going to go to business school, like graduate school, but I was so angry. I said, I want to be a lawyer, <laughs> so I want to be a civil rights lawyer. So I actually changed my life and went to law school to represent people who have been discriminated and mistreated. And then I see in Chicago, they have special contracts set aside for minority people, right? every minority but Asian. Why? Because we have no representatives. They'd say, oh, well, let's just cut out the Asians. Because the politicians that are African-American, Hispanic, they worry about their people. 
So they said it's easier to cut the Asian out because what are they going to do about it? So we actually had to file a federal lawsuit on that just to get Asians back on the list. The other thing that people don't realize, what I did was a, a friend of mine, she owns a beauty school in Chinatown. So she called me and she said, Ann, you got to help me because the licensing exams for her students are in the law, says it has to be in English and Spanish. But her, uh, her students cannot read or write it. And you don't need English. Yes. And it also affected Vietnamese and Koreans. So I spent two years lobbying the state to get it translated into Chinese, Vietnamese, and Korean. They just forgot about us because we didn't have anybody there. And so guess what? I was able to, I almost filed a lawsuit too, but we were able to get the ch first exam in Chinese translated and distributed and many students are now able to take the exam. I have many people, I don't even know who they are, say thank you Ann for what you've done because I was able to get my license and do my job in Chinese. So yeah, and I realize they will forget us or they don't care about us unless we show we have political strength. So we do good in business, we do good in school, we do good in participation. Like you were telling me a story of one of the people who interviewed is also kind of touched me. I keep thinking about what you told me that her, she had to, you know, her mom and her had to hide and escape and, you know, but she became very successful despite all her overcoming. I think as the immigrants, we have a story. We have grit, we have care, we should fight for every right that we can get because that's what this country promises for all of us. Anybody can do it. But it's not easy, but we have to do it, otherwise things will get bad. And right now, we have a tough issues with uh, this China-US relations. And it's very easy because we are the only minority group in the United States that has a law specifically excluding us from this country. It's called the Chinese Exclusionary Act. No other minority group in this country has, has such an act, a law, to try to destroy uh, our community in this country. And that was only repealed not that long ago. So we can't forget that this can happen to all of us. And that's why we need elected officials that are sitting in office to help us dictate this. This is why it's critical. So if you're young, old, doesn't matter. If you can't read it the, because it's not in Chinese, then you demand them because it's your right to have them provide a translator for you to help you vote because if you don't vote, they don't care about us. And we need to have our own candidates. Thank you Sorry. so much. <laughs> You've been su do, doing such a great job. Well, it's amazing. I think that you know, we really need people to come out, and more people like you to come out and to you know, reach out to people and other people, at least, they can come out to vote. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've, I've done, it's so much harder when you're not an elected official. Like in Illinois, we had this problem, too. Uh, we had one, our very first Asian American elected to the Cook County uh, Circuit Court. What a lot of people don't realize is Cook County, Illinois has the largest court system in the entire United States. And so when she died unexpectedly, the Sup Illinois Supreme Court replaced her seat with a non-Asian even though we had achieved her election. And so I lobbied. I almost lost my law license. They threatened me. But I don't really care. We have to fight for what's right. So I fought and said, that's not right. You should interview qualified Asian American lawyers for that open seat position. So when, you, when you were threatened, have you, you know, think about giving up or were you feared? And what did you do? So what happened was I found out that one of the Supreme Court justices was very angry with me because I don't think they realized we are not going to be quiet. And I got the press involved. She was furious at me. And so she said, you know, she threatened my law license. And because she said, oh, lawyers should not question a judge. But that wasn't the issue. Okay, so I was angry because I was at an event supporting another candidate and I was furious. And I said, I don't care. I said, I, if this is what it means for me to lose my law license. I don't want to be a lawyer in a state that discriminates against any communities. And then it feels like they have a right to threaten me for speaking my freedom of speech to do it. So guess what? I didn't lose my law license. Everybody's so fired up. And the good thing is, is now they appoint so many Asian judges, support so many Asian judges. And I know it's because of what we did. If we didn't speak out, if we didn't have the press, they would still keep stepping on us. 
And I know everybody, I, I, I'm guessing everybody watches probably also Chinese or Asian American. They have their own story how they were mistreated and stepped on. And we can't let that happen. Yes. We cannot let this happen. You got this guts probably from your father. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so my, you're right. Yeah. So my father, he, um, he immigrated from Taiwan, uh, but his family actually immigrated twice. They're from China to Taiwan to the United Taiwan States. Too, yes. Yeah, he suffered a lot of hardship. Yeah, the pioneers. Oh my goodness, yeah. So, but he came here in the 1960s to the United States and he came to Atlanta, Georgia at the height of the civil rights movement. He actually worked with Martin Luther King. Oh, wow. And the reason he met him was because he used to be an expert, he's an expert in judo, so he's a black belt. So he decided he wanted to teach some of the black children at the YMC. He said, why shouldn't they learn? They're good too. So when he took his kids to compete, they, a lot of the competition plays say, oh, you can't come because your kids are black. So my dad got very angry. And so Martin Luther King called him and said, we're going to protest. And my dad said, ah, don't worry. We're going to take care of it. He's so funny, my dad. And so he showed up anyway. He beat them up. I know, he, exactly, exactly. So he said, don't worry, we got it. So he actually showed up. And the first time he did, they canceled the tournament because he didn't want his kids to, to compete. So, but they still exercise, he don't care. And then the second time, he threatened them. He said, you know what, we're gonna, whoever comes out with that trophy, his team is gonna be ready to challenge them in the parking lot to show who's the best, right? So they got worried, they said, okay, forget it, we'll let you compete. And his kids got the number one and two spot at the tournament, and he's so strict, He's the, he only allowed them to wear the white belt. He said they're not good enough to wear black belt yet, but he's very strict about it. But that was like the star. He always wanted to fight for what's right. And in Chicago, this is a very serious story. In the 1950s, there was a Chinese American man. He did not speak English. He got sick with tuberculosis, so they put him in quarantine. And he did not know what's going on. They didn't bring him a translator. so. They put him in a mental institution and give him all kinds of drugs, never provided him with anybody who can translate for 30 years. 30 years. Yep. And his family's all undocumented immigrants, so they're afraid to come help him. So he was in, and then so he developed uh, mental health issues because they locked him for 30 years. So they, the, the public guardian, Cook County Public Guardian's office found out about, came to my dad because he is a mental health professional. And they asked, and he speaks the dialect. And he said, will you help talk to this man? So my dad discovered the story that he wasn't mentally ill. And so he testified against the state of Illinois, even though he worked for the state of Illinois. And that man is uh, uh, David Tom, T-O-M. So you can Google it, it will kill you because that is a, such a bad case of discrimination. And my father suffered consequences, but he says, not right. So he testified. Um, they freed David Tom and they paid him money and uh, David Tom became a good friend of our family but he's always got he's like a child now because of how they treated him wow. you know we should always stand up for what we believe yeah but for now you know after the 2016 election you know many people are feared yeah yes many people so what do you see this uh, cultural change and how do you see our future so what I think is the majority of our country wants to be inclusive, wants, understands that we are better with all these different viewpoints, that we're stronger because of our immigration, because of our immigrants, no matter how they came here. Because all of them, I don't know any immigrant that hasn't worked so hard. I'm sure you interview a lot of people that have such a tragic never, story. Never it's someone. None of them are lazy. None of them, yeah, none of them. And, and many of them come to great things. Like, I don't know if you heard uh, John Yang, who is the executive director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice. He spoke, um, I want to, I can't remember, it's been a long conference. But he spoke a few days ago, and I didn't know, and I know him because he's a lawyer, and we, we serve uh, different organizations, and he's an old friend of mine. But I didn't know when he was younger, he was undocumented. And he was scared until Ronald Reagan passed the law to allow them to get there. But can you imagine if he wasn't in our country? He has done so much good for exactly. so many people. Yeah. And he's just one example. So I think most of America wants to support women, wants to support, support minorities, sees the value of it. I think there's a small vocal group that's 
we need to change that. That's a old, we can't always change everybody, but we need to be stronger voice than them. And I, I believe we will get there with people like you, <laughs> Thank you. and people other like people. You. No, yes. <laughs> I just do a little bit, little Let's bit. Let's work together. Yeah, yes. of course, I love to. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>